Well, the map in the old days, I mean, way back when I was there, was, was a map of unexplored country. So, you know, the methods that you used to make maps were really, really simple, old-fashioned ways of doing it, the old explorer's ways. Um, but, of course, then there came the airplanes, and then came the air photographs, then came the satellites, and in no time at all, all the maps are completed. Right. Uh, but what uh, uh, sort of paint us a map now uh, uh, on audio, uh, um, what does it look like? What is it? Well, I mean, it's a hell of a big continent. I mean, it's, uh, most of it is ice cap anyway. The only really interesting bits from a map maker's point of view are the mountain ranges, or the bits that stick out of the ice cap. And uh, some of these go to quite a, a fair size height, like up to about 17,000 feet, that sort of thing. I've been up to about 13,500 on a several occasions, making maps from the summits. Right. But, but y yes, I mean, the, the, most of the mountain areas are around the Antarctic, around the uh, sort of perimeter of the Antarctic, and then there's one trans-Antarctic range which goes most of the way across the Antarctic. And that's a, a, a spectacular-looking mountain range. And that was actually the territory that I was mapping when I was with the New Zealanders. And I was lucky enough to be really the last man to make a map on the ground, on foot, because the year after I'd finished that map, then uh, airplanes flew over and took photographs, and so it was no longer possible to, to make a map of complete unexplored country. There was always some photographs available of that territory. And that, of course, took all the steam out of it, as far as I'm concerned. Right. I mean, one of the most magical things about making maps of unexplored country is you might take, say, three days or three weeks to, to go along the coastline to a cape you could see way in the distance, and you didn't have the faintest idea what lay beyond that cape. Now, when you get to that cape and you round the cape, then all the land you see stretching out before you has never been seen by the human eye before. You're the first human being to see that. Right. And the same, of course, happens when you climb a mountain and you look over the ranges which lie beyond. You're the first human being to ever see that. Right. And that was absolutely magical. Now, as soon as there were air photographs available, it didn't matter that man had never been there before. I knew what was going to be there, so I wasn't interested. So I then moved up to the Arctic. Uh, what about temperature swings, and uh, what are we likely to uh, encounter? What will we encounter temperature-wise when we get there? Well, this time of year, you know, it's really quite mild, <laughs> relatively speaking. And, uh, you know, with the right clothing, the right food and so on, uh, it's, it's, it's quite balmy. I mean, it's just below freezing point or just a few degrees above freezing point. But you're, you're not going to get any wrinkles, you're not going to get any frostbites, uh, you're not going to get any ice in your beard. Um, but you're going to feel cold from time to time just by simply being outside and exposed to the wind for a while. Now, in the winter time in the Antarctic, that's a different story. You know, it's one of the coldest places on the face of the earth. On the other hand, if you're living there in the winter, you don't, if you're clever, go outside in the winter. You have all your instruments outside and they are also <coughs> have magic wires which come into the hut and you just push a button and it tells you what the temperature is. You don't actually have to go out there. Except that when I was there in 1962, with the New Zealand expedition, I was responsible for all the dogs, looking after the dogs. The dogs, of course, they stay outside the whole winter. So even in temperatures down to about minus 50, they would still be outside. And now this is the temperature now. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'd have to go outside every day to look after the dogs, you know, to make sure they're okay and feed them and, and so on. Right. Now, uh, that below, t 50 below is not the wind chill, that is the actual temperature. That's so the what raw happens temperature. With yeah, just the raw temperature. Then, then if the wind is blowing, of course, it's much lower. Much lower. Uh, what about now? Uh, the temperature is now going to be about 25, 30 on average uh, above uh, oh, freezing. Yes. Yeah, I would guess it'd be about that. Yeah. Now, Antarctica is—it's—it's it's known as the last continent or the the bottom of the world, ma. Bottom of the world, like uh, like James Cagney and White Heat, top of the world. But we're going to the bottom. Now, the Antarctic is. Uh, there have uh, been a lot of controversy involved with who discovered what and who got there first and and who did what. Um, as well as the Arctic. Uh, we know about Admiral Perry and so on and so forth. Uh, but talk about the politics and the controversy surrounding the, uh, the exploration of the Antarctic. Well, the thing is, that it, was, it was very much a, a personality thing, and, and to some extent a, a nationalistic thing in those days. You know, we're talking about 1907, 1908, 1909, and 10, round about that period. And in those days, I mean, all, a lot of countries were very, very eager to, to make their mark on the, on, the, on the world, the Antarctic in particular. 
Uh, so you had Shackleton, who was there with British expeditions, you had Bird, you had Amundsen, the Norwegian, and uh, various others. Now, I mean, you, you, but you also, within, say, Great Britain, had personality conflicts, you know, where you had Captain Scott, who was also British, and he was kind of... Uh, battling with Shackleton to try to get uh, some score points for himself. And there's a huge amount of ego and, and, uh, and ambition, personal ambition, was uh, uh, sort of fueling all this stuff in the Antarctic all those years ago. Uh, who has the inside track on all this? Uh, who can we... Uh, the, what's the inside story on who got there first? Uh, who, who, who made the biggest impact? I think, I think in the case of the Antarctic, it's, it's relatively simple because you, you, the, the South Pole is actually up on a plateau of the Antarctic. The ice is moving, but only very, very slowly. It's just like a, the icing on a cake, which is sliding towards the edge and dropping off. But it's moving so slowly. Now, there was, for example, Amundsen got to the South Pole ahead of Scott by, I don't know how many days, or 20 days or something like that. And he left a tent there and a the flag there. Now, this was found by Scott because both men were good navigators. So, in a way, they kind of vindicated each other. <laughs> of course, Scott would, Scott would love to have got there and not found Amundsen's tent, but that was just because he didn't hurry up, you know. If he had gone a bit quicker, he would have beaten Amundsen. And after all, Scott was retracing the route already pioneered by Shackleton up the Beardmore Glacier. So, he had much less excuse for not getting there ahead of Amundsen. Amundsen had to find a new way through the mountains. He was driving dogs, and, and he did it, because he's a brilliant, professional, tough, old son of a bitch. <laughs> Whereas Scott was, in, with the best word in the world, you, you'd have to say he was a very good, nice amateur, right. but uh, not a particularly competent one. And what year are we talking about, the first... Uh footsteps uh, at Antarctica, what, what year would that be, what era? I mean, the date that, that Amundsen got there was in, was in 19, 1911, and right at the end of 1911, I can't remember the exact date, in December, and then Scott was there just a few weeks later in, in January, I think, of 1912. What about your position in history in the Antarctic? I mean, you were there early on, uh, not quite that early on. Uh, where do you stand? Now, you've written uh, nine books, I believe. Yeah. I don't know if, I, I guess not only on the Antarctic, uh, but where do you stand? Where, where do you place yourself in, uh, in, in, in the history of the region? It's, it's an interesting one, that, because in many ways uh, I'm part of it. I'm sort of one foot on both sides. I'm mean, sort of on the cusp, you know, where, because if you look back, say, over the period from Fridtjof Nansen, the great Norwegian explorer of the Arctic, uh, and right through to, say, Admiral Byrd, all of the great sort of explorers that came together, so to speak, to finally reach the North and the South Poles were all in that period of about 60 years. Now, right at the tail end of that, Admiral Byrd, now, I was actually in the Antarctic when Byrd was making his last expedition. I was making my first expedition. On the other hand, what then happened was that shortly after that, the Antarctic was crossed from one side to the other, and that, in a way, um, left only one big journey to make in the world at that time, and that was the journey across the North Pole, because Everest had been climbed, the Antarctic continent had been crossed, and now there was only one thing left, and that was the crossing of the North Pole, and that was what, 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 what I ended up by doing. So, in a way, I'm sort of tied into that period of pioneers, but right at the tail end of it, because everyone that came after me, I would describe as an adventurer as opposed to an explorer, because they didn't actually explore anything. Yeah, yeah. I was the last one that actually produced a map of unexplored country. Although the word explorer, of course, is used so, so freely these days. And that map uh, was in 1963, am I right on that date? Well, 1962 was really the, the date that I, I finished my last actual mapping in the field. But then it took me a year to put the map together in New Zealand before the thing was finished. So I guess the publication date was 63. Right. Okay, uh, briefly, I know, uh, I, I think uh, I think we're getting ready to, uh, to something is going to be happening in a few moments. Uh, your paintings are incredible. Your paintings and your books. Uh, is there a way people can uh, now? Most of your original paintings are scattered throughout the world. I understand that two paintings are owned by the royal family. Uh, is there any way to uh, to contact you about your original paintings or commission you or or, or get a hold of uh, copies of your books? A phone number, a, a way to contact you. The extraordinary thing about this is that the books have a very short shelf life unless you're a very famous writer. Uh, I mean, I, it's very surprised these days for, for any book to be around three years after publication, unless it's having a miracle sort of run. And of course, my books fall into the category of the former, so they're all out of print and have been for ages. You it's don't have copies unlikely. available? 
I, I, I was never smart enough to buy up all the, all the, the, the spare ones. <laughs> Publishers have a way of saying, look, you know, we've got some spare copies. We're thinking of pulping this book, which I can tell you is one of the worst things you can ever hear from the human voice. And then you, they say, well, would you like to buy some at a low price? And of course, I never at the time they say that have enough money. <laughs> to buy a thousand copies or something. <laughs> so I've run out long since. Before we close, you had a great story about Christianity coming either, I guess, to the Arctic. Uh, I don't know about Antarctica, but I think the Arctic. And uh, and I don't, I believe it was in the Arctic how the Christianity came to the Eskimos there, and the uh, uh, it was a great story. Uh, where was it in the Arctic? Yes, well, I mean, of course, there are lots of great stories about missionaries. I mean, you could go on for years about those. <laughs> Tell that story, though. <coughs> well, I mean, <laughs> the way that... You see, the Eskimos love good stories. And so what the missionaries used to do in those early days was to was to sort of heat up a hut and have an open window. Then they'd preach to the Eskimos from the open window with a nice warm fire burning up their bottoms, you see. And they would uh, persuade the Eskimos then to come in, those who wanted to uh, hear the story better and to be nice and warm, but they could only come in on the condition that they were baptized. Sign up. <laughs> <laughs> and that was in the North Pole. And that, that was up in <laughs> Northwest Greenland. <laughs> and there are no Eskimos in the South Pole. No, I'm not. Not to my knowledge. What is the thrill for you? I mean, are you? is it kind of an old hat to be visiting here again? Well, you know, in a way it is. I mean, I, uh, I am one of these people that hates going to the same place twice. So this is probably why I'm a, a pioneer in that sense and making maps and so on. But that also applies to everything else I do in life. So, I, I mean, I'm coming back this time because I would really love to go back to Hope Bay, which is my old base in the Antarctic. And I haven't been there for about 38 years. And uh, the last couple of times that I've been down, we got close to it, but there was too much ice. So I'm really hoping to go back. Now, if we succeed, then I would say there's a very slim chance indeed that I'll ever be coming back. Because I've seen it, I want to go and do something else. Okay, first up is the Zodiac Tour. We're going to uh, kind of look around the islands uh, by, by Zodiac. It's snowing. We're getting some snow, and it's uh, summertime. So we're going to be gone for a while. Our driver is Kim Robertson, so we're just going to listen to her uh, narrative here. Here we go. Oh, really? There's a crab eater seal right up here in front of us. I don't think we've had good looks at these yet. They don't haul out onto the beach like Waddell seals do in the fur seals. So they're only found on pack ice, so this is a good look at one. And he's probably been fighting with another male because he's got a lot of blood around his face. And we're going to bump around a bit. Don't, you know, don't be alarmed or anything. He's sort of bumper cars out here with the ice. The most numerous of the seals, they, I've heard estimates up to 10 million, but it's probably more like 2 or 3 million that live in the Antarctic. Lots and lots. You see the scars, the characteristic scars on the belly? Those are leopard seal teeth marks from when the animal was young and escaped. I try to be kind of quiet, but you can move around. You can climb up on the bow if you want. Just, just stay low and you sneak up to it. I'm going to turn the engine off so you can get some pictures. We're looking at a crab eater seal. Folks are taking pictures. Uh, looking straight out, uh, just to our left, and straight out, again, uh, using the clock, uh, at about 11 o'clock, right now about high noon, looking straight ahead, uh, folks coming off the Zodiacs to uh, Wally's hut, and that's where we'll be in a little while. Uh, we're looking at some folks going up the sit, slight mountain you can stand when I slow down a little bit, from Wally's hut, forward, so and uh, as I understand this, it's, uh, the yeah, ice is down. solid it's underfoot, which will make it a lot easier. Right there. Yeah. Yeah. Really old. All the like aluminum foil. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I took a picture of it because it just looked yeah. like, you know, aluminum foil. All the air is compressed out of it, so it's very dense, solid. Kim was just explaining, we're looking at some ice, which is snow textured on yeah. top, and then, and then... Ice, icy, clear, uh, translucent ice you see right through it, and sort of just, it's floating around, but it's, it's, it, of course it isn't, it isn't solid in the, uh, in the, on the surface of the ocean, but it's just floating there, it, it sort of bounced like a ship would be, it's just uh, incredible, and the blues again, the blues coming up, and the, the bluish green coming up, we're moving along now, you can hear the, 
as we come through the ice cream erupt. And again, is our uh, pilot. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There are ten of us. We're on the uh, Zodiac.